Not only is Beaulieu home to the National Motor Museum, but also to these extraordinary Abbey ruins. The more that I visit historic houses, the more I've realized how many of them are built on monastic foundations. In this episode, I'll be exploring these spectacular Abbey ruins with Lord Montague. So we're now coming into what would have been the Abbey Church, which was the size of a cathedral. And going in search of some rediscovered buildings out on the Beaulieu estate. I've been to many historic houses and you're the first house I've come to where I'm actually seeing the ice house itself. I knew there was an ice house in here, but I didn't know where it was for years. <laughs> I was playing in these woods and never knew where it was. When I married into the British aristocracy, it was the start of a wonderfully exciting journey, but it was also a little daunting. I became a Viscountess, and for an American girl from a small town outside Chicago, that was quite a shock. I live with my husband Luke, heir to the Earl of Sandwich, and our family at Mapperton House in Dorset. Mapperton has opened up an extraordinary new world for me, and I can't wait to share it with you all. So if you love castles and manors and stately homes as much as I do, please join me as I head off to visit some of Britain's most spectacular historic homes. So, as you know, Beaulieu is here because King John granted some land to Cistercian monks in 1204 and founded an abbey. This is what remains because Palace House, of course, was not built over the top of the old abbey, but around the gatehouse. And so this building, which was the Lay Brothers dormitory and refectory, survives. Ah. And so this is where we now have an exhibition downstairs and a banqueting hall upstairs. So this is another exhibition space for people to come through and see, is that right? That's right, and this is just worth looking at because this model shows just how extensive the buildings of this Abbey mm. complex were, were in this building. Okay, so this survives. This survives, and this building survives, which is now the parish church of Beaulieu. But all oh. of the rest was just pretty well destroyed. Uh, some re remains on the ground. But because it, it, of Henry VIII? Yeah. Unbelievable. And, and this was, you know, more or less the size of Winchester Cathedral. It was a, oh a big Oh my goodness. Church. Let me take you upstairs because we have these wonderful uh, embroidered wall hangings created by my mother to tell the story of Beaulieu Abbey. And they really are um, wonderful pieces of art. Oh, they are. So she produced incredible. about one of these a year. And this one depicts the foundation of the abbey, uh, which all started with King John having a bad dream. He had ordered some uh, troublesome monks to be stampeded, um, but actually his men refused to carry out his orders. And he then felt so bad about it in the night that he, he had a, a dream about it. And so here you see King John mm. being in his dream, beaten by the abbots ah. who, who, who he had regarded as his enemy. And then he suddenly, it would seem, realized the error of his ways and then granted this land here uh, to monks from Cito in France, Cistercian monks, to found an abbey. And we use this for weddings and dinners and receptions. This had been used as a sort of farm, a glorified farm shed. At one time it was actually a farm house, so it's been converted several times over. I think these little slit windows are probably the original pattern, whereas these bigger ones, um, not. I mean, right, this is right, where the lay course. brothers slept. Whether they had partitions, I'm not sure. But this, this is actually, I think, my favorite of the wall hangings because of the colors. And I particularly like this deep purple back and the angel and the stars. This uh, depicts the dedication of Beaulieu Abbey, which happened in 1246. So foundation 1204, 
uh, dedication 1246. So, you know, some decades later, yes. several bishops attended. This is wonderful what your mother did. And it's a mixture of canvas work, an applique, screen printing, hand embroidery, machine embroidery. She didn't really mind mixing it up. Right. Um, as long as it produced the it's right end. Stunning. Answer. So, I mean, these two panels really just show monastic life. You know, you've got forestry, keeping sheep, making wool, honey, beekeeping, uh, wine, or yes, grapes. Yes, wine, yes. Plowing the fields, uh, harvesting, baking bread. I mean, the detail really is the storytelling. The monks knew all about the use of herbs, both medicinal and culinary. So, I mean, this is a, a lovely one, really a lot of detail in this. Honestly, it's wonderful. It's funny because from the outside, you don't necessarily expect to see so much, mm. not just the detail of what your mother has created here, but the timber is up above. Yes. And, you know, as you pointed out, these windows here and the arches, mm. I mean, there's a lot of detail that it luckily has been retained. This recalls the, the closure of the abbey and the dissolution. Oh. And here is Henry VIII granting the ownership or selling the ownership to Thomas Risley, my ancestor, the first Earl of Southampton. So yep. we have, as my mother imagines it, the final monks leaving who were pensioned off. There's a, a myth that there was a gold Madonna which the monks didn't want the crown to get their hands on. So here we ah. see a monk throwing it into the local pond to protect it. Right. But it's never been found. Is it right? Um, you can actually see a man here beginning to demolish the abbey and the mm. bell is already on the ground. Such incredible stories here. But what a great mm. space as well. Yes. And these were made this, to fit the spaces. Yes. Which, uh, it's just wonderful. As an American who has married into the British aristocracy, I am fascinated by royal history, and in particular, royal queens. I just love learning more about British history, which is why I subscribe to History Hit, who is sponsoring this week's episode. History Hit is an on-demand channel and award-winning podcast network, which helps me in my research and tells the stories that shaped the world. History Hit has two new programs on royal queens, which I'm really enjoying. These are Becoming Anne Boleyn and Becoming Elizabeth, both with expert historian Susanna Lipscomb. There's also a wonderful series on the women who made history. One of the great strengths of History Hit is the huge variety of content. There are hundreds of programs, a thousand plus podcast episodes, and 5,000 history-related travel articles. And every week, they launch 15 new podcast episodes and two new programs. I've set up a special code for you to get 50% off the first three months when you use the code American Viscountess. Link here and down below. History Hit is a wonderful resource for anyone like me who wants to learn more about the past. And I'm sure you'll enjoy the channel and podcast episodes as much as I do. So we're now coming into what was the cloister of the Abbey and the grass area would always have been open but the paved area would have been enclosed and of course a semi-ruin with undergrowth and trees established has a charm of its own and there's a balance to be struck because obviously we are under an obligation to maintain this as a scheduled ancient monument but you don't want to just tear all the plants off the wall because they actually you know are part of the atmosphere of the place now it is a lovely place for me as well as many others to come and just walk and it um, really do you know what's so i think fascinating for me is that i feel you know walking through uh you know these abbey ruins if you like gives me this real sense of peace i mm. I've seen different parts of, of course, Palace House and the National Motor Museum and present day to bring in the visitors. This is where mm -hmm. I would want to go, the history here and knowing that at least some of the Abbey survived. You might like to look at this wonderful uh, uh, quote of St. Bernard, who was really the, the main, the founding father of the Cistercian movement. Right, so it says, it is good for us to be in this place, for here a man lives more worthily, 
falls from grace more rarely, rises more swiftly, walks more carefully, rests more peacefully, dies more happily, is absolved more speedily, is rewarded more bountifully. But I think what really speaks to me here is, you know, the last part where it says, if you walk more carefully, well, of course, then you're going to rest more peacefully, you'll die more happily and rewarded more bountifully. But for me, it's all about this walking more carefully, being mindful, staying in the present moment, not allowing that head mm -hmm. to be absorbed by so all the time of the external world. Which is so easy and to... to stay yeah. inward. Yeah, well, it is, this is a good place to do it. Okay, so we're now coming into what would have been the Abbey Church, which was the size of a cathedral. And the choir monks would have actually worshipped at this end, possibly behind a screen, with the laity down at the west end. So this box hedge with the cross represents roughly the position of the high altar. Okay. But actually behind it would have been a series of radial chapels. Oh, um, I'm just, yes. I, I'm trying to envision it now. It's the vertical dimension where you really have to use your imagination, yes. but it was a big building. And these piles of rubble here indicate where the columns were all ah. the way down that would have held the roof up. Fantastic. Um, so, right. Oh, my goodness. It, it is vast. You can see over to the, what would have the been columns. the west door. Yeah. And this wall is all now that survives. Apart from these steps, so right. these are called the night steps because the choir monks who slept up here mm. um, had to sing offices in the middle of the night. So they had the night stairs, so they had direct access into the Abbey Church from their sleeping quarters. And then here's the high altar. Yes, and we do occasionally have outdoor worship here. Um, and on, for the um, mm. 800th uh, anniversary of the founding of the Abbey in 2004, some of the monks from Mount St. Bernard, which is the remaining Cistercian Abbey in England that's active, exactly. some of them came here and, and participated in oh, a special service. It's wonderful. You know, it's a real sadness that... It, it is. That, uh, um, it, I mean, it's an awful piece of destruction. And yes. yet, somehow, the passing of time and, and the the, 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 the establishment of nature where you know, man has done his worst does actually have a healing quality in itself. And, and as we said, it, there's somehow imprinted here, I think, the spiritual quality of the yeah. place. No, I couldn't agree more. Mm. Beautiful. What a lasting memory to see these beautiful ruins giving a glimpse into what it was like here in the medieval era. And out on the estate, I'm meeting up with Rachel, resident agent here, to find further evidence of monastic life at Bewley. So where are you taking me, Rachel? Well, we're heading now for the Monk's <laughs> Well. We're crossing the reservoir part at the moment. Okay. Um, so, but we're heading to the source, which is the spring. I hear water. Yes, it runs from the well into the reservoir on our left and then disappears from the reservoir down this drain here and through. Can you see that brick arch, Julie, in amongst the ferns? Yes, I can. It disappears down through that brick arch oh my gosh. and all the way to the gardens. Oh, and there it is. <laughs> magical. This is absolutely magical. It's like finding some sort of mystic grove, isn't it? It really is. <laughs> oh my goodness. This is the source of the spring. This is the So the spring comes up within here. Okay. And tell and me a little bit about this structure here. I believe it was built um, by the monks in the 13th century. Um, I think it then got overgrown and it was rediscovered in the 18th century by Lord right. Montague's ancestors. Right. All right, so can I, have, can I go down and have a little peek? Absolutely. Absolutely. 13th century. Incredible. So inside here is where the spring would have come up. This was built by the monks. 
Yep. Rediscovered in the 18th century. Do I have that right? Oh I, my goodness, yeah, it's fantastic. So. I want to swim in here. <gasps> Rachel, it's lovely. <laughs> it's so lovely. Like, can you drink this? I think they used to. Uh, Mary and Lord Montague tell me that they drank it as children. But it's, it's literally crystal clear. I mean, this water is crystal, crystal clear. It is. So this was built 13th century, as you yes. said. And then it was the source of water for the abbey, the monks at the yes. abbey. And this was a real find. A massively important, and I think it came down in sort of um, troughs from here down into the abbey. Right. I believe, obviously now it runs in pipes, but right. I think it originally it ran in troughs. How wonderful. And is this used at all, if this water used at all anymore? For yes, any absolutely. Part of the we use it for watering all the gardens and in fact it supplies the fountains uh, in the ornamental gardens, the, the Victorian vegetable garden yes, and yes. the Victorian oh, flower garden. Fantastic. What a wonderful treasure really for it's me super, to come and see. Yeah. And just the way that just they the dome and everything. Yeah. It's just lovely. built it perfectly. Yeah. How brilliant. Oh my goodness. What a sight. I mean, this is pure magic. I think you could set up like an entire glamping. It's a lovely spot, isn't system it? System here, you know what I mean? Glamping business. I'd run it. I'd happily run the glamping <laughs> business here. Water, it's wild garlic, nettles, nature, you know, bird song everywhere. Yes. Yes. Be a much, much more simple life, I think, is what a lot of us are craving these days. I am. I know oh, I am. Definitely. <laughs> definitely. I find it endlessly fascinating exploring the ruined buildings scattered across historic estates like Bewley. Lord Montague is taking me to see a recent restoration project, which shows how different life was before the early 20th century. So every large house, of course, had a, 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 an operating kitchen and a kitchen garden for, to produce the food, uh, but it needed also ways of preserving that through the winter. And so uh, what used to be done before they had refrigerators is that you'd have an ice house, which is a big pit in the ground in which you put ice in the winter, and that kept it cold right through into the summer, and you could preserve food in it. I've been to many historic houses, and you're the first house I've come to where I'm actually seeing the ice house itself. It's wonderful to, to see it. So this is how they yeah. would preserve their food. Yeah, and, and most of it's underground. Right. But the interesting thing for me is that this whole area was completely overgrown, and I didn't even, I knew there was an ice house in here, but I didn't know where it was for years. <laughs> I was playing in these woods and never knew where it was. And this arch had collapsed forward, <gasps> so it was at an angle. And uh, our local contractor managed to get his digger grab underneath it and no. dig it out. No. And, and <gasps> push it back oh up. Oh my goodness! So if you look inside, you can see it goes This is incredible! Around. In there, in the winter, yes. ice would be brought in from the local pond. So ice made from fresh water. And this would be filled up and then there would be, I think, straw put on top and then the food would be added. Uh, to, to for preservation, and then they would gradually take ice out to bring to the kitchen when it was required if the cook was making ice cream or right. something that needed. So, right. Yeah. Oh my goodness, this is incredible. So you didn't know that this was here as a boy? Well, I never discovered, discovered it. it. I right, kind of right. heard that there used to be an ice house somewhere in this area. So when we think about ice houses, when do we think that they actually just stopped functioning? I mean, obviously, I would guess probably at the start of the First World War because right. there wasn't the labour to carry the ice. It would have been a big operation to bring the ice in and probably after the First World War there were probably early refrigerators. Yeah, there were early refrigerators. Um, how fascinating. There's quite a useful picture here to sort of illustrate how the ice was, was put in. Wonderful. But I mean, a, what a treat. But imagine if you were the cook and you wanted something out of the freezer, you'd have to send a boy up here to go and get it. I mean, it would be a half an hour's operation. <laughs> it yeah. certainly would. Or made. Well, that is one invention I think we both can be very grateful for is the refrigerator. Indeed. And the freezer. We just wanted to say a huge thank you to all of our American Viscountess patrons. Without the support of our patrons, we wouldn't be able to make these really important historic house episodes. So if you love castles and manors and stately homes as much as we do, please do check out our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash American Viscountess.
after leaving Lord Montague, I actually wanted to come back here to the Abbey and just sit within where the Abbey used to sit because I felt the energy of this place and within me, it really spurred this sense of calmness and mindfulness and really an opportunity to connect to the history um, that is so rooted in here at Bewley, these monastic roots, the monks walking around, and I really felt that. And so for me to be able to just come back here and sit, uh, sit here where this wonderful energy is all around me, kind of just sums up my day here at Bewley. Next time, I'll be exploring Bewley's maritime history with Mary Montague Scott. This is a, uh, a replica 18th century shipwrights workshop, workshop, which I did as a project about six years ago. And my son William will be taking to the Bewley River. Um, obviously not blue sky and sunshine, but you know, it's England. What do you expect? Ahoy! <laughs> <laughs> Not taking any notice of me. So embarrassing. <laughs>